I grew up in a very small rural town called Masontown, Pennsylvania. It's in Fayette County, which is about, which is one county south of um, Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is found. Uh, I was a country kid. Um, I would say, I'd, actually I'd probably say more rural. Country is kind of, I'd say, you know, rural Georgia or something like that. We were just kind of, you know, small town folks. To me, going to Pittsburgh, which was about an hour north, was going to the big city. Um, I was intimidated by tall buildings. The, the town I grew up in had a six-story building, I think. That was the biggest building we had in there. Um, and the other thing is I grew up ridiculously poor. Um, to give you an idea how poor, our kitchen table had three legs. We pushed it in the corner to keep it up. Um, the types of jobs we had in our town were uh, coal mining jobs. Uh, so in other words, uh, if your parents could get a job as a coal miner, you'd probably make about 60 grand a year, and you could live a really good life in Masontown. But if you didn't find either through cronyism, nepotism, favoritism, a job in the coal mine, you basically didn't have anything. So I grew up there with my mother and my sister. Um, uh, my mother suffered from a mental illness that was undiagnosed her entire life. And we didn't find it out until after, actually, she passed away. Um, and we lived, and when I talk about the tough life that we had, um, it was something that I actually had, I hid from the world until I got to the point that I felt like I had succeeded enough that I could wear it as a badge of honor. Um, I was ashamed of it, but today I wear it like a effing badge of honor every single day. Because um, to me, it reminds me of the perseverance it takes in order for you to achieve anything in life. So, you know, growing up, I think uh, I had never thought about being an entrepreneur. I didn't have any, I didn't think about really going to college either. I just kind of thought about wanting to have food every single day. I wanted to be able to eat. Um, and I knew that that required hard work. I knew that required, um, like my mother, like I love her to death, but she wasn't a role model. Um, I, she motivated me to want to work really hard. Uh, and. I remember the day whenever I've, I didn't know it was entrepreneurialism, but I, I remember the day whenever I knew that I wanted to control my own destiny. A lot of entrepreneurs, they're, not, they're, they're kind of curious about what, they, what they're capable of doing on their own. Like, what's the pinnacle of my performance where I can't rely on somebody else to give me resources in order for me to be successful? I have to do it myself. And I never forget, I was really, really hungry. And um, I was in uh, the house, and I was trying, I wanted a Little Debbie snack cake, which I think there's still 25 cents, maybe 35 cents inflation or whatever, right? And, um, and I remember having 15 cents. And I remember digging through my mom's purse, digging, looking underneath the refrigerator. I remember looking in the couch, and I could not find a stupid dime. One dime. And I remember it was the summertime, and I was walking outside, and I was hungry, I was tired, and I remember leaning back and looking up at the sun and realizing that here I was, I think I was like 10 years old or something, and I just wanted a dime, 10 cents. And that dime might as well have been a, a thousand miles away from me because I could not manifest a dime in my life. Right then and there, I saw the importance of taking charge of your own life. So from that point, um, basically, you know, let me tell you a little bit about kind of um, the kind of student I was. I was a really good student, you know, growing up. Um, why? Because I like to go to school because you got free lunch. <laughs> um, also, I was really interested in math. Um, I liked algebra. I liked uh, anything that involved kind of figuring out um, a problem. I love problem solving. And again, at the time, you know, you're too young to know that that's what you like. You're not, you're not forming phrases like, I like problem solving. You're just thinking like, this, is, this class is fun. Um, but there was one thing that I did better than anybody throughout all 12 years of my um, K through 12 education. I was the best artist in every school that I was in. Um, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, I was the best artist in our school, hands down. Um, I loved to draw. Whenever I was really, really young, um, we, you know, we couldn't afford paper, so I would open up the cereal boxes. And uh, I'm not trying to depress you guys. I'm actually trying to tell you, like, like, like this was character building things. So like, let's not like, like let's not like, you know, di go to, you know, dig too deep or whatever. I'm trying. To, like, these are character building things that I'm proud of. Um, and I would draw food. I would draw Snickers bars. I would draw Kit Kats and so forth. 
um, you know, with my crayons and so forth. Um, I, can, I can draw you exactly the way you look. I could draw you identically the way you look right now um, for $100 each. We can wait outside. I can, you know, whatever. You know, make a little quick extra money before we leave here. Um, and uh, I, like I mentioned before, I love comics. I wanted to draw comics. Um, and I loved Garfield. I loved Jim Davis. And I used to go up to the library and I would check out. You guys, the library, you know, remember that place, right? <laughs> like Dewey Decimal System, all that stuff. So, yeah. Again, I always say I'm only 35. I don't think I'm old, but that critical point in life whenever I, you know, I, not only did I transition off to a whole new world, Rochester, New York College, I also transitioned basically my, my the prism in which, in which I viewed life. You know, being able to see the entire world um, through the web. But anyway, back to comics. So I used to go up to the library, I used to grab Garfield books, and I would try to draw, draw Garfield and so forth. It was really fun. Um, and I went through high school, and um, I was a senior in high school, and at that point, I still wanted to basically be a cartoonist. And I had a great art teacher. And um, I'm sorry, not a great art I had a great art teacher, but I had a great guidance counselor who saw that throughout school, my sister and I, we were, we were really, really good students. Everybody kind of knew, they kind of knew our home situation. Um, but fundamentally, we were always, um, you know, straight, almost straight A or straight A and B students. Um, and he put my, my guidance counselor, I'll never forget his name, is Mr. Gillespie. Um, he pulled me into his office, and this is, you know, just, just so you know, like one of the most important things as a young person is finding people who you trust their opinion to help you figure out what the next move is in your life. Because I fundamentally promise you right now, all of you are arrogant. Trust me. Everybody is arrogant because they always think that they figured a lot of things out. The older you get, the more you realize how much you don't know. And I thought I had life figured out. I was going to be a cartoonist. You couldn't tell me anything. I have, I have hair on my chin. I'm a grown-ass man. How can you talk to me like that, right? Um, but he pulled me in the office and he said, Don, look, you're not going to make any money drawing. You're not. Um, there's this thing called graphic design. It's commercial art. Um, I, I didn't even know what that was. And he's like, you draw things on the computer and so forth. You really should do that. Um, now, one of those words in, the, in his statement, everything else was kind of BS to me. But one word he said really stood out, computer. But what I fell in love with was, it was math. I had loved math, but suddenly now I could control it. It was like I was taking algebra, and I was able to actually apply it in programs. So, you know, I was, there was this fortunate thing that I had in my life, which was sports. I was a jock. I was a really, really good athlete. But I had this dirty little secret that I didn't tell anybody. Every morning in homeroom, I snuck to the library to a computer program. Every free moment I had, I almost stopped drawing. I almost stopped being an artist. I would sneak to the library computer program. Um, at that point, I had assumed that I was going to be a graphic designer. Uh, and uh, you know, I was taking art classes and so forth in school. And I, f there, I was a little bit disappointed because there was no computer programming. We were on the computer, but I was just like finger painting. I was just like doing t 2D designs and putting text in certain places. Um, but you know, after a while, whenever your classes tell you what you should be doing, <laughs> you know, you start to think, okay, this is going to be my career. But I promise you, this is the optimal time for you to really set your trajectory and your destiny. This is the time for you to start a business. This is the time for you to, to say, you know what, um, I'm going to figure out a way to not have to pay those school loans right now. Or I'm going to figure out a way to, to start a business. Uh, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like, you know, you're suddenly going to be getting the most responsibility you've ever had in your life, bills. Uh, but this is your optimal time. And I'm going to tell you how I didn't do that. Because <laughs> um, I remember, I was kind of thinking, I just want a job, I want to make money, I want to be able to like never be hungry again. I remember going off to college and like them saying, you know, uh, uh, there's this Gracie's dining hall where we can go in there, we can eat all, and we can eat as much as we want. That was like the greatest thing on earth. That, that's why I had to go to college for me. That's why I went to college, basically for that. <laughs> um, so I worked at a great design firm um, called uh, Agnew Moyer Smith. 
Um, and there's two great guys there, Reed Agnew and Don Moyer. And um, they really did shape the person who I am today. The first thing that they did was um, they brought me in and they said, there's this whole new thing that we think there's a lot of business. It's the web. Or no, I'm sorry, back then we called it the World Wide Web. Right? It was no for sure. It was the World Wide Web. They basically said to me, if you want a job here, you're going to have to design websites. Um, and I said, I want to keep my job, so okay, I'm going to figure it out. And that's where I fell back in love with basically computer programming. So kind of think about the things that you were passionate about when you were a kid or the things that you learned to be passionate about. Like, don't give those things up. Like, don't give up the things that, you know, maybe you like to do, but you're not doing in your major. Suddenly I was given this opportunity to computer program again, just building websites and so forth. And I kind of fell back in love with that. Um, and, you know, I mean, long story short, basically I'd become a web designer. And it, it was, a, when I was in school, it didn't even exist as a major. Um, so, you know, we were sitting there and we were building web pages and so forth. And I was building websites. Um, but Reed Agner and Dawn Moore, one thing that they did was they basically thrust me into a ton of responsibility at a very early age. And my advice to you is to find somebody who's willing to trust you very early on. I remember being a designer. And when I would design something, I would just maybe move something over 10 pixels. And then I would run over to my boss and I would say, what do you think? And he'd give me some feedback. And then I'd go back and I'd run over again. And then something clicked in my head. I basically was a punk. I was afraid to design something, you know, like work on it on my own, and then say, this is what it should be. This is a solution. I don't need you to art direct me. So I started rebelling and I started designing more and more. And then my boss was coming at me and saying, well, wait, wait a minute. Why, why do you have so much done? and you haven't actually you know, talked to me. And I said, well, you know, give me the opportunity to fail. And I think that's, as a younger person, that's the one thing that you want to try to do if you really want to control your career is to try to put yourself or, or work for a company or work for somebody or work someplace where they're willing to give you a chance to fail. They're not going to basically turn you into a quasi-intern whenever you go into that company. That's why startup companies are great to work for because we don't care how old you are, whatever, you really need, you really, really need to act like you have five years of experience or something because we don't really have the, the luxury of educating you on how to do things. My bosses saw that I wanted the opportunity to fail and they gave me that opportunity. Um, they put me in front of companies like McDonald's, Steelcase, um, Caterpillar, where I was presenting to senior vice presidents the things that we were doing. So I was this you know, really poor kid from the projects um, with tons of self-consciousness. Um, and they took all of that out of me by forcing me into positions where I had to basically grow up, become a professional, learn how to present, um, not be afraid you know, to kind of basically steer or you know, kind of command a room, um, which I didn't know at the time were, were key ingredients to being entrepreneurial being a leader, being able to motivate and push people. And also, quite frankly, trying to be an example for others to follow. I didn't know that at the time. Um, but by them doing that, it gave me a lot of confidence. So it's important for you guys, whenever you're working for somebody, again, to try to find people who basically, they're willing to listen to you when you describe what you want to be. You know, you, if you're not thinking about that right now, what do you want to be five years from now? It's very hard to think about that, but don't think of it as a job. Don't say, I want to be uh, an engineer. Think about what you want. I want, to be, I want to be leading people. Think about that. Or I want to be um, doing something innovative. Um, and innovation is kind of like a generic word, but maybe you know, I want to do something that no one else is doing. I want to work for a company that's trying to fundamentally change something. When you're able to start articulating what you want, people who don't really know what to do with people who have nothing on their resume can start to get creative. And I said, that's a pretty good mix for an internet entrepreneur. So now at this point, right, I've got 10 years of business experience, so I have a little bit of a swagger. I think that I know everything. Again, here I am, 20-some uh, years, you know, 27, thinking I know everything. I'm going to go off, I'm just going to start a business, right? Screw it, you know, like, if my boss can do it, I can do it. Again, my ears were closed. Um, so. I decided I was going to um, 
try to start a company. I was going to try to start it at night. And I had this idea, and one of the things uh, that you should do whenever you're trying to come up with an idea for your own, for your own business is try to solve, scratch your own itch. Most, the idea behind it was supposed to be a content management system that I think we had, the uniqueness was if you're like a law firm, you have a website, but the most important aspect of your website is your attorney directory. You can't just buy an attorney directory off the shelf. So we were going to give you all the core content management system, but we we're also going to have these vertical apps, dealer locators, attorney directories. Uh -huh. So you know, we basically just fizzled through the money that we had. That company failed. Um, but remember, you know, I had this determination in me that I was going to try to make a business. I was going to try to be successful. So I pivoted immediately. When I thought about hiring, and I thought about whenever I was hiring designers at my old design firm, I hated, I hated, hated, hated hiring them because I had a full-time job. So John, John's kind of talked about what the resumator is. So I basically, at that point, I ate a piece of humble pie because I had a failed company. And the first thing that I did was I started ingesting information about how to run a technology startup. So you guys are fortunate that you have tons of history. I promise you, if you watch the TechCrunch 40 demos from the very first TechCrunch 40, if you go to sites like Mixergy and you start to hear the stories of entrepreneurs, um, you know, I was fortunate whenever John invested in me. Um, he, he flew me down here to Santa Barbara the other time I was down here, and probably the only other time when you had bad weather. Um, uh, I met Kevin O'Connor, who was, uh, I think, the founder of DoubleClick, right? And um, I remember listening to Kevin O'Connor's story long before I ever met him. So you know, I was kind of feeling I was in, like, kind of the startup entrepreneur rock star scene whenever I met him. Um, but my point is, is if you want to do something, you need to start ingesting information about it. So all these videos that people are putting up, um, if you want to be a startup CEO, you need to start hearing the stories of startup CEOs. Um, you're not too young to have a subscription to Inc. Magazine or Forbes Magazine because it's not just a, there's, there's tips in there about how to basically grow skills that you don't have yet. You guys don't have skills around leading people. You don't have skills around motivating people and so forth yet. If you start to ingest information, like just put on your headset and don't listen to music, Listen to an entrepreneur talk about their journey. That's how you can really start to learn a lot about basically building a business. And that's what I did. Um, while I was coding Resumator, I was just ingesting as many stories and as many tips as possible about building a startup. Uh, the next thing I did is I educated myself on how to get into a startup, or into the startup world, networking. If you guys want to work at an early stage startup, early stage company, you got to basically start to hang out with people who are in that world. You guys are fortunate being out here. You're more likely to run into them. Um, I wasn't. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I did was I connected with them over, over email. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of folks that, that were out here in uh, rooms like uh, Hacker News and so forth, and I would just start asking questions and so forth. I'd say, do you know such and such? I was just trying to connect with people, which, by the way, I was able to leverage later on for partnerships and so forth in my business. Um, and when I ingested enough information about how to run a company, I then started applying it. But I, the reality is building your personal network right now is going to be one of the most important things that you can do. You can get a job by asking somebody for an introduction. The more time you spend on Facebook as a senior, the more likely you are going to be stunting your ability to network in the future. You know, how many of you guys are connected to John Greathouse on LinkedIn? That's a damn shame. John Greathouse is a venture capitalist who started, who, not, not started, but rather was an early stage person in a company that was acquired by Citrix. He, he down the road, at, and he's educating you. But, but the whole idea is, is that if you can build an authentic relationship with him, not just think you know, you're just going to you know, send an invite to him, so that whenever he sees your LinkedIn invite, he's thinking, I know this person, and it sounds like they're motivated and they want to do something. Um, that's an that's a, a authentic relationship that you need to build with as many people who can help you in your career as possible. So I, f I messed up. I punked out. I quit my job. That's not the punking out part. Um, and then I got a great job offer from another company. Um, I took a job at Grasshopper, which by the way is a great company, but it stunted the growth of Resumator. 
because suddenly I was focusing on all these tasks inside of Grasshopper, and I wasn't really focused on building Resumator or, or growing as an entrepreneur. So I punked out, I went to Grasshopper. Company um, you know, was, was slowed down because of that. And then basically I finally, I said, okay, I gotta focus on Resumator full time. Now luckily, I'd been doing some of these things right and I was able to start networking. Um, and um, I was able to talk to a guy named David Cohen from Techstars. So we, we were probably sitting on I don't know, 20 customers at the time, um, over five months, I think. <laughs> You know, it was pretty bad because I wasn't focusing on the business. And um, I hadn't networked with David Cohen before, and I was able to leverage that, that connection to say, hey, let us sponsor Techstars. Let's, you know, let's just give away our product to, you, to your early stage companies. So those connections connected me to basically all of the tech entrepreneurs that I know today, just from that Techstars deal. They put their, our little logo up on the bottom of their site, and then that's where we started getting enough traction that it, got, it led to John recognizing our company because somebody mentioned us. Um, um, now, you know, Resumator is not a success story right now. Like, I think John said it best before, and I agree. We're, we're a great Pittsburgh story, but we're, but we're not a great national story. We're a great opportunity, but we're not a great company yet. Um, we're still trying to figure those things out. And here's some of the mistakes I'm making. Um, and I encourage you to try to think about in your career how to avoid these mistakes. I think one of the mistakes that I'm making as a, and, and to give you an idea too, here, here are the brag points. If I stand over here real quick, brag points, and then I'll kind of wrap up here. Um, I, I run the company that has both presidential campaigns. These are things that you mentioned before, but think about how this sounds. I have you know, we run, we have both presidential campaigns using our platform, some of the hottest growing startups. Um, you know, I was recently featured as um, a regional finalist for Entrepreneur of the Year, blah, 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 blah. I step over here and I think we have a company that grows steadily, but not exponentially. We have a, an audience of 600,000 businesses, but we only have, you know, a couple thousand of them. Uh, and um, we're trying to find senior people in the city of Pittsburgh that kind of understand how to grow a software company. But, but let, me give you some, let me give you some concrete pieces of advice, some just, just bullet list pieces of advice. If you guys want to gain respect, um, or if all, you're trying to start a company and you want to try to have people help you with it, you basically have, you think about this, it's words, actions, and then accomplishments. You're going to be trying to use your words early on to try to get a job. You're going to be trying to use your words to convince people to work with you. Um, and that's only going to help you so far, because they're just words. Just like early on, if I was just talking about my business, to John's point, nobody was going to care. Now, you can then start to have some actions. If you start to act, so in other words, you know, if you're trying to start a company, you're going out and you're telling people what you're working on, they see you're working on your code, you're showing them demos, or maybe you're looking for a job. Um, I had a, a job opportunity at Saatchi and Saatchi in New York, an ad agency, because he told me my portfolio sucked. If I wanted to work in an ad agency, I had to build ads. So I went out and I built ads. I designed ads, I showed it to them. They offered me a job. I turned it down because I don't live in Rochester, it's too cold. Um, <laughs> and then finally, so you think about with my company, right? We had actions. We started like, you know, gaining momentum. People were seeing that we were building a really great piece of software. But you know where you really, really, really start to gain momentum in your career? and your ability to, to hire great people or to work with great people in your startup is when you have accomplishments. So like getting Salesforce to invest in us, getting the presidential campaigns. Once you start to have things that you can check off as accomplishments on your resume or in your actions as an entrepreneur, people will start to follow you much more quickly. So you need to figure out how to tap into those things.